This is a production of Cornell University Library. All right, well, I've got 401, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Wright, Director of Mann Library here at Cornell, and I'd like to welcome you to our last library book talk for the fall 2021 semester. Uh, perhaps a few of you may know that Crossing Disciplines with Cornell Authors One Book at a Time uh, is the tagline for Cornell University Library's Chats in the Stacks program. So it seems particularly fitting to be ending our fall book talk season with the book being featured today, both because today is its actual date of publication and also because of the richly cross-disciplinary perspective that it presents. Like all the other chats, chats talks of this semester, today's event is coming to us as a webinar. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize that questions from the audience are warmly welcome. So if you find yourself with a question for the authors at any time during today's webinar, please use the chat function to send that question our way. My colleague, Evelyn Ferretti, will be gathering all questions posed via chat and present them to our speakers during the Q&A session that will follow the speaker's presentation. Before proceeding to my introduction of Drs. Green and Kaiser, I'd like to include an acknowledgement that Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. This confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people past and present to these lands and waters. Now on to our speakers. Dr. Susan B. Kaiser is a professor emerita at the University of California, Davis in the departments of gender, sexuality and women's studies and design. Her research centers on the interplay between intersectional feminist cultural studies and fashion studies with a current interest in theorizing time through fashion. Dr. Kaiser is the author of more than 100 journal articles and book chapters in the fields of textiles, clothing, and fashion studies, cultural studies, consumer cultures, sociology, and related fields. She is editor of the journal Critical Studies in Fashion and Beauty and a fellow and past president of the International Textile and Apparel Association. Dr. Kaiser's book, The Social Psychology of Clothing, Symbolic Appearances and Context, was published in its second edition by Fairchild Publications in 1997. Her book, Fashion and Cultural Studies, first appeared in 2012. Its second edition, now co-authored with Denise Green, is, as I mentioned earlier, hot off the Bloomsbury Press just today. Those interested in getting their own copy can put it in order directly with Bloomsbury using the discount code included on the slide that is currently being displayed. Dr. Denise Nicole Green is an associate professor at Cornell University, where she also directs the Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection. With a PhD in sociocultural anthropology from the University of British Columbia, Professor Green joined the faculty of the Department of Fiber Science and Apparel Design in the College of Human Ecology in 2014, where her work has crossed many boundaries of discipline and media. In addition to her teaching and research at the College of Human Ecology, she is affiliated with the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program, Cornell Institute for Archaeology and Material Studies, the American Studies Program, and the Department of Anthropology. As a fashion anthropologist, she uses ethnography, film production, historical methods, creative design, and curatorial practice to explore the intersections of design, culture, identities, and dressed embodiment. As an award-winning filmmaker, curator and designer. She mentors students in the production of their own film projects, curated fashion exhibitions, and natural dyed textile and garment designs. Her scholarship is published widely in both professional and scholarly journals, and she is on the editorial boards of the Clothing and Textiles Research Journal, Fashion Studies, and Critical Studies in Fashion and Beauty. From 2017 until this year, she served as the Vice President of Publications for the Costume Society of America. I'm so very pleased that Drs. Green and Kaiser have agreed to celebrate the release of their new book with the talk they are giving to us today. In addition to our congratulations, please join me in giving them a very warm welcome. 
Thank you so much um, for that very kind introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, with all of you today. Um, so once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for celebrating with Susan and I today, the launch um, of our book on December 2nd uh, with Bloomsbury. We wanted to start out today and we really appreciate um, the land acknowledgement that was given by Sarah Wright and also want to acknowledge um, Susan is located on the territories of the Patwin, uh, which is where the University of California Davis is located. But both Susan and I, as we begin this text, we begin our book with acknowledgements and start the book by acknowledging that not only are our universities physically occupying homelands uh, dispossessed from indigenous peoples, but that we're both from land grab universities um, or land grant universities as is another way to put it. Um, and that Cornell University and the University of California were involved as well in the dispossession and ex uh, expropriation of many thousands of acres of uh, stolen native lands from across uh, the United States and that these lands ended up forming um, large portions of our various universities endowments. Um, and so we want to acknowledge that dispossession in addition to the physical places where we are today. So we are going to uh, begin by uh, going back to the place actually where um, I met Dr. Kaiser. Um, and since we cannot physically be in the stacks today, um, what you're looking at on the screen is Mann Library. Uh, Mann Library is the library for the College of Human Ecology. And I was a student in the College of Human Ecology from 2003 to 2007. I did my undergraduate in fashion design. And my freshman year, I made my way over to Mann Library, like all uh, good first year students do. I learned about where my library was located and I learned about the section of the stacks where I would find books on fashion, uh, fashion history, and an area of fashion studies I didn't even realize existed, which was cultural and social studies of dressed embodiment. Um, I came to Cornell really fascinated by the opportunity to combine fashion design with sociology, anthropology, and um, the study of human culture. And so when I got to the stacks, I went to the GT section um, and I, as I was just browsing around, um, I noticed this book, <laughs> The Social Psychology of Clothing. This is the, the actual sex, though I'm sure things have moved around a little bit since 2003. Um, but I found uh, Susan's 1997 second edition revised of The Social Psychology of Clothing. Um, and I think it's, we wanted to start this talk by really bringing us into the stacks and really thinking about the way that the library is this place of coming together of ideas of people. And so when I found this book, I was blown away. It was all of the things I'd been thinking about, but someone had actually written about them um, and done this comprehensive review of the literature and was doing their own research and, and studies. And so I read the book cover to cover and I sent an email to Dr. Kaiser as my 19 year old self. Um, and I was blown away when a few days later, maybe not even that long, she wrote back to me. Um, and the fact that this book in this library, in the stacks 
connected to a real living human being who was thinking and writing and researching the very topics that I was so interested in diving deeper into, um, that she existed in the world and I could connect with her. And that's sort of the anthropologist in me. I'm always connecting the archive and the, the library with the living uh, beings who, who are still around that we can communicate with. And so um, she wrote back to me and that was the start of our relationship together as, as thinkers. Um, I went and did my master's degree at UC Davis um, and studied with Dr. Kaiser and then went on to do my PhD elsewhere. But we've stayed in touch all of these years. And she approached me about the second uh, edition of Fashion and Cultural Studies. And immediately I said, yes, I would love to work on this with you and to update this text and to add new chapters. Um, but really it all began here. So we wanted to begin our presentation thinking about the library as a site of connection. Well, I'm so happy that I answered that email. <laughs> that, <laughs> what, what a life um, transforming uh, response that turned out to be. Um, and I want to start um, by thanking not only the library, by the way, my first job at the University of Texas was um, reading the stacks to make sure the call numbers were in the right order. Um, but uh, working with Denise um, on this revision has been such a joy as it has been um, ever since I've known her. Um, her intellectual curiosity or sense of social justice, um, her ability to get things done and, um, and just the, the way she makes projects more fun and interesting. Um, I'm really grateful for that as I am to the, everybody at the library for making this possible. Um, so we start here actually uh, with the theme of time and space or place. Um, noting that uh, we're kind of an intergenerational collaboration. Um, that's me on the left um, at the age of four, um, the place I was in Orléans, France, um, where in it was the 50s, late, well, late 50s. <laughs> I think it was 50, 58 um, or so. Um, wearing a typical kind of 50s outfit um, but when we found um, this image or our parents found this image of Denise at the same age, um, one of the first things I thought of is, wow, not only are we dressed really differently, but um, we didn't have plastic straws in the 50s. It, they were paper. And here you've got this convoluted um, plastic straw. And I think Denise probably wants to say more about her outfit. Yeah, I think those of you um, that know me know that I, I love fashion and I love dressing up every day. Um, and this was clearly part of um, my, my personality from a very, very young age. I was adamant about dressing myself, about mixing and matching this kind of bricolage of, you know, overalls and bracelets and sunglasses, the bows, the hat. I mean, um, I'm, I've always been a, you know, more is more maximalist kind of dresser. And so um, to think about this uh, and see it actually in this uh, young age was um, kind of interesting for me. And then thinking too about our approach to this text. Um, we wanted to start with these images, both because they bring us back to a time before we even had entered school, um, when we were the same age, both Susan and I, but in different places. I was in upstate New York. Um, she was in Fran France. Um, and then also, you know, reveal it reveals some of our shared identities um, as well in terms of age in this case, though we are intergenerational now, but this sort of moment side by side, we're the same age. Um, and we share other, you know, shared identities. Um, we are both white women. Um, we are now, you know, we both teach at universities. Um, and we also have divergent identities too, in terms of sexuality and other things. And so this was really a kind of starting point um, that we write about in the opening and the acknowledgements for our text, um, where we are and our positionality. 
So one of the metaphors we use in the book, and one of the biggest themes in the book is about the interplay between time and space, how there's a total convergence between time and space. Um, sometimes we hear metaphors like two sides of the same coin, um, but we prefer kind of a fabric um, metaphor that comes from a Mobius strip where um, there's a kind of ongoing continuity, but also a complete convergence of time and space. Um, they can't be separated into an either or kind of experience. You know, where we are can't be separated from when we are. Um, so we, we want to point out how um, fashion is one of the ways through everyday style that we articulate this idea of convergence between time and space um, through the fashioning of our bodies. So this is, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, the, uh, we are going to structure the rest of our presentation today, um, moving through all of the chapters in the book. So we've sort of begun at the end in a sense with uh, thinking about time and place and age and generation. Um, and we'll move back uh, to the beginning of the book uh, with fashion studies and cultural studies concepts, which we really begin framing the text and then move into thinking through intersectional transnational fashion subjects. The rest of the book really takes um, different aspects of our subjectivity and focuses on, on them in each chapter, though considers them uh, from an intersectional feminist perspective. Susan. Yeah, so basically the framework um, as compared to the 2012 edition um, is, is um, primarily the same, but a whole lot of work went into revision, revising and updating and uh, whatnot. And reviewers had suggested two additional chapters. Um, so chapter five on religion um, was one of those two chapters and um, the other was chapter nine, dressed embodiment. Um, so you can see the framework is organized around subject positions, but the whole, um, idea of the book is intersectionality. So um, whereas um, religion, for example, might be highlighted in one chapter, it, it's done so with an eye towards all the other subject positions. And I, uh, one other aspect of the revision as well was we really wanted to decenter the narrative of sort of white, wealthy, thin European American fashion, which has really been such a dominant narrative in a lot of fashion history books and fashion studies books. And so through the revision, each of these chapters um, moves through lots of different examples um, and case studies. And so in revising, we, again, were really committed to decentering that what has been a kind of dominant narrative in fashion studies, um, and then center voices of people of color, people living with disabilities, um, and et cetera. So we'll go through each of these chapters and we're just pulling a few of the case studies um, in each slide and we'll talk through them. Uh, but we encourage you, of course, to read the entire book, um, which will give you all of the, the case studies. We're just going to highlight a few from each chapter today. So first we wanna pay tribute to um, one of the guiding theorists um, for, our, for our book. Um, in addition to um, being a brilliant theorist, Carol Tulloch is a um, dear friend. Um, and her, a guiding concept throughout is the idea of melding style, fashion and dress by the use of hyphens in order to kind of foster an understanding of the parts and holes. Um, the reason this concept that she developed um, based on her studies of Black British style and um, could refer you to her book, The Birth of Cool, where she also um, deals with style fashion dress. Um, what had happened earlier in the field was that there tended to be some binary oppositions between style and fashion. People had their preferences, fashion versus dress, and it ended up kind of um, separating the subdisciplines, you might say, um, in the field. 
and sort of um, kept becoming a tedious kind of um, debate that somehow putting these together conceptually and recognizing that there's a complex here with style referring to individual fashion statements, if you will, fashion being a collective process of change and dress reminding us of the very, very important uh, aspects of the body and the, the ways in which we modify the appearance of the body. We're also guided, of course, by the um, culture, many cultural studies scholars, but in particular, uh, Stuart Hall um, and his work with Paul Duguay and others um, in the text doing 1997 text doing cultural studies, which is this really fascinating um, sort of tracing of the Sony Walkman through what um, Stuart Hall and Paul Duguay call the circuit of culture, um, which you see here on the left. And so what we do in the book is we actually update the circuit of culture um, into this circuit of style, fashion, dress, where instead of Hall's concept of representation, uh, we use the concept of distribution. And this will enable us to think as well about materiality in addition to representations like Hall has discussed that are um, moving in discourses. Uh, and so distribution is both about the distribution of images and fashion magazines on the internet, um, social media, television, film, et cetera. But it's also about the distribution of materials and how um, garments are actually made. When we're thinking about fashion, it's uh, the body, it's materials and it's images. It's really all of these things. So we replace place uh, representation or sort of update it with distribution. And then um, identity, which can tend to have a sort of sense of, of being fixed, we instead are thinking about identity as subject formation. So, you know, we are always changing, right? Identities are not static, they're dynamic every day. For example, we are older than we were yesterday. Our age is constantly changing. And of course, um, some aspects of our, some of our subjectivities are, are, are more um, mutable than others, but at the same time, we wanted to think about a term that would enable us to uh, grapple with the way that fashion every single day is embodied um, differently. And there, there are all kinds of opportunities for um, re-articulating and, and being and becoming in the world every single day. And so subject formation, of course, is intersectional. So the graphic um, on the right is thinking about many of these sort of overlapping, almost three-dimensional, translucent uh, um, uh, circles, right, representing things like race, ethnicity, disability, place, gender, religion. And certainly there are many, many more aspects of our identity that um, intersect and influence and, and help us to produce who we are every single day. But these are the ones that we're working with um, primarily in the text. As we think about the circuit of style, fashion, dress, throughout the book, um, we emphasize this model in the, in the first couple of chapters and then in the case studies as we move through the different subjectivities in the subsequent chapters, we think through the circuit and the other aspects of it. So as we think about the flows um, between say production and consumption or regulation and subject formation, we think about materials, we think about the everyday creativity. Um, one of the assumptions that we make in the text um, is related to sort of the structure agency dynamic, which includes, you know, processes of persuasion, as well as consent of resistance, um, but that we're always in this really interesting dynamic of, you know, regulation, um, as well as, age, you know, agency and, and expression through things like creativity. Um, so that agency comes in that choice, but at the same time, we are, we are part of certain structures and regulations that are pushing against um, some of that. And of course, the cultural anxieties. There are so many um, cultural anxieties that impact the way that we appear in the world um, or that we, we work through in 
putting together what we choose to wear every day. Uh, there are a lot of ambiguities that we must negotiate, ambiguity of meaning. Uh, for example, we might wear something or see someone and that ambiguity is something we negotiate. And there's also the kinds of strategic ambiguities um, that are created by institutions um, uh, through capitalism. And of course, ambivalence is a big theme uh, because of course we both love and hate fashion, as Elizabeth Wilson says, uh, just as we love and hate capitalism. And then of course, power, uh, which as well is dynamic, it's ever changing, um, and power structures are really shaping these relationships in the circuit of style, fashion, dress. So the cover photo um, for the book was taken by one of my students, uh, Simone Eloisa White. She is a fashion design student who traveled with me and uh, my colleagues, Erica Johns and Fran Kozin, along with 12 other students to India in January, 2020, right before the pandemic hit. We were uh, very fortunate to be able to spend about two and a half weeks um, in India traveling to many, many different uh, factories along the apparel supply chain. Um, chain, I think, is an awful metaphor because it's not, it suggests that it's, it's very linear and, and predictable. But in fact, what we learned in this trip is just how opaque um, uh, these so-called chains are uh, and how diverse they are um, in terms of factory sizes and in terms of how a production line might be set up. But what I really love about this photo, this was taken at a cut and sew facility owned by actually the um, sponsor of our trip. It was uh, called Master Rouse Temple for Hope, Opportunity and Happiness was actually the name of the fac factory. Um, and in this, in this factory, um, you know, we're, we're walking up and down the production lines. Simone took this beautiful photo. And it, as we, if we think about this image through the circuit of style fashion dress, we can see the ways in which dress is regulated, um, you know, the hairnets and the masks. We also see garment workers as fashion subjects. Um, each of the garment workers has self-fashioned um, in unique and different ways. So there's that structure agency, right? The choice and the creativity alongside the regulation. Um, and you'll notice in her hair are these flowers, which are so fragrant. And so she's wearing these flowers as a kind of perfume. And it reminds us that fashion isn't just what we wear um, or even how we wear it. It's all of those things and more. It's a multi-sensory experience experience that also involves scent. There's so much fashion right to scent as well as uh, the material, the physical, the feel, um, and of course the visual. There's often so much of an emphasis on the visual. Um, we really like this image for bringing us back to some of the other senses um, as well. And so you can see, you know, the machines, we see the production. Um, so both producing and, you know, consuming fashion at the same time. And so if we look back, this is an image from the Kiel Center, uh, another one of Cornell's amazing archival resources. Uh, this is an image from around 1910 of garment manufacturing in New York City. And you can see there are some things that are quite different, but also um, some things that are quite similar. In a lot of ways, garment cut and sew in terms of the production line, um, it's a very labor intensive uh, process to cut and sew garments. Um, and that's still the case today. Um, but as we'll hear from, with, uh, hear from Susan a little bit later in the presentation, she'll talk a little bit more about uh, garment workers in New York City um, at this time. But I want to also, um, another favorite image uh, from the Kiel Center archives that really highlights the ways in which garment workers um, are also fashion subjects um, and the way that garment workers have used fashion in advocating for better working conditions. Um, 
Here we have a group of, um, th these are from the International Ladies uh, Garment Workers Union records. Um, and so these are IG ILGWU uh, garment workers who are striking or marching, I should say, in solidarity with uh, a strike that was actually happening across the country, uh, a strike against manufacturer um, Ganter and Mattern, which was in the late 1930s. And so they're at a union convention and they are saying, you know, we do not buy these bathing suits. So clearly the bathing suits they're wearing um, are made by another manufacturer, but they're literally wearing the fashions um, that they are referencing in this, in this uh, march. I think it's a really powerful image. And so when we think about production, again, um, to suggest that it's a, a simple linear chain doesn't get at the complexities of working with fashion. These are all images I've taken um, in India over the last uh, six or so years I've been teaching this course. We go every other year, um, typically when it's not a pandemic. And you can kind of get a sense here through all of these images, a kind of uh, supply chain from fiber to fiber spinning, uh, to the yarn, to the dyeing, uh, warp beam preparation, warping looms, uh, power looms, cutting fabric, cut and sew. And of course, there are lots of different kinds of fabrics. There's, these are, this is illustrating a woven fabric sort of supply chain, but of course there are knits, there are non-wovens, um, but it is a very complex process to get to the garment that you're wearing today. And so what we're hoping to convey, right, with this image is just how many people have touched the garment that you are wearing today, that there's so much human labor. Um, and the fashion industry, of course, has done an excellent job of disconnecting, creating this disconnect between production and consumption so that we're not thinking about all those many, many hands that have um, produced what it is that we're wearing. And so part of our work in this text is redressing that production consumption disconnect, but also thinking about the way all of the people who make our clothes are also fashioning their bodies every day and are also fashion subjects. <clears throat> so um, the third chapter gets into the, the topic of intersectional transnational fashion subjects. And again, kind of a theme of time and place um, comes up here because this is part of a, uh, both images are representing involvement in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the image on the left is at Hyde Park in London and the one on the right is in Tokyo. Um, notice the dates are very close, only six days apart. Um, but also there's the intersectionalities involved um, in the images, um, cross-cutting issues of um, race, sexuality, um, gender, um, and other, other kinds of subject positions. Um, the image on the right um, specifically um, calls out um, issues of um, race and ethnicity. Um, Denise observed that um, the, the term melanin in this case refers not only to skin color, but it also, um, it, it also kind of uses the graphics associated with um, the situation comedy Friends. So it's a kind of an appropriation um, that comes into play um, that she combines with um, a mask that um, has, is fashioned or that um, has been fashioned for um, the purpose of highlighting involvement in the BLM movement. The next chapter um, moves into thinking about fashion uh, and national identity and fashioning the national subject. Um, so we know that uh, women's bodies in particular have often been used to display the nation in different ways. Um, that national dress, we, we discuss national dress and in, in all of its problems and the ways in which it produces ideas about the nation. Um, but we also use this chapter to think about 
decolonizing um, and fashion, how fashion has been used in different efforts to decolonize from Gandhi in India uh, to examples like these two here. Um, both of these pieces, one is a commemorative cloth on the left, one is a garment on the right. They're both um, part of the Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection and come from right around the same time. The one on the right is a shirt that says no, 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 over and over and over again, or no uh, in, in French. Um, it's done using batik uh, technique. So there's wax applied to the textile and then it's dyed with indigo. Um, there's a lot of indigo dyeing done in West Africa. Um, and it was worn in the months leading up to a 1958 uh, constitutional referendum in Guinea. And that constitutional that referendum to vote no would mean to decolonize um, from France and to vote yes would mean to remain a French colony. And so this was really a political shirt to show, uh, to, to persuade um, people to vote no. And I believe it was 95% uh, of Ghanaians voted no. Um, and so decolonized to become the Republic of Guinea. And so the uh, commemorative cloth on the left is commemorating the first um, president of the Republic of Guinea, um, Ahmed Sekou Touré, and he is, is sort of appropriating as well, or it is appropriating um, the uh, St. George, uh, and he's spearing, literally spearing uh, the serpent that is colonialism. The next chapter moves into thinking about um, racial rearticulations and ethnicities. Um, the image actually on the left we use earlier in the text um, before this chapter, um, but I bring it here in conversation with the image on the right of Patrick Kelly um, in 1988. This image was taken when Kelly was uh, attending um, an event uh, to support uh, fundraising for research for um, HIV AIDS. Uh, and the image on the left is a pretty contemporary one from 2019 of Lil Nas X. Um, and on the left, he's wearing this holographic fringe cowboy get up. Um, and so his, his first big song uh, was, you know, country song, but um, had actually been banned, uh, had been not allowed to be part of the country uh, charts. So there was this sort of, in, you know, incredible um, expression there of exclusion of uh, a black performer who is combining and articulating um, country music with rap music. And so we're thinking about in this chapter through rearticulation, the way that fashion can be used to make um, these articulations or connecting points between disparate styles and how it can also be used um, in, the, in the case of Patrick Kelly to reappropriate and to reclaim um, racist imagery. And this is what Patrick Kelly does um, with the gollywog that became his logo. Um, and so he's wearing here um, jeans that are by Liberty. This was a, a brand of, I shouldn't say jeans, they're denim overalls. Um, which as well is a reference back to the civil rights movement. Um, so combining that with this, uh, you know, re-articulation of the gollywog and reclaiming um, something that had been racist imagery um, and re creating a new meaning for it. And so there are a number of scholars that we reference here, Eric Darnell Pritchard, um, as well as Sequoia Barnes, um, who write about the way that Kelly uh, is not only reclaiming, but also um, Sequoia Barnes argues that this is a kind of camp aesthetic. So this is both a, a queering of, um, as well as a reclaiming. Um, and similarly with Lil Nas X as well, there's a kind of camp um, aesthetic going on. And then, of course, there's the transnational aspect with Kelly, um, very well known for wearing uh, frequently this hat, uh, which says Paris Uprim. Um, and he was the first American fashion designer uh, to be invited to show his collections at Paris um, Ready to Wear Fashion Week. 
So the next chapter focuses on religion, and it was a very, very challenging um, process. I went through, I don't know, 25, 30 drafts or something, uh, was having trouble structuring it, um, and ultimately decided on the um, circuit as a way of um, structuring. Um, and that enabled me to um, think about production as well as all of the other parts of the circuit, including consumption. Another challenge was one that I faced when I talked to people about writing this or drafting this chapter. Um, and that was that um, religion has, you know, it's oppositional to fashion. Um, this image of the yarmulkes in Jerusalem on the left sort of points to the fact that um, religious dress does not, um, not exclude fashion necessarily. Um, and so what had happened um, since the 1980s when um, um, Muslim fashion began to be marketed um, internationally by, um, by Turkish um, uh, designers and the apparel industry, um, it just proliferated um, throughout the world and by the 21st century, um, had really taken hold. And so numerous scholars have written uh, fab fabulous books, ethnographies um, on Muslim fashion in various sites throughout the world. So that area was really well um, documented in the literature, but what is not so well documented or even discussed at all um, is what we might think of as sort of unmarked dress like um, Protestantism. Um, and so how this, the challenge was how to have a balance, um, including multiple religions without structuring um, the chapter in that way. Um, but this focus, um, including the circuit and production um, allowed me also to uh, draft um, the chapter talking about um, immigration and the important um, uh, contributions of uh, Jewish immigrants in New York City and beyond. Um, around the turn of the, into the 20th century. And so that was another way to kind of make these connections between uh, production and consumption. And the next chapter was on class. Um, and um, in this chapter, we really try to, again, be very intersectional in our analysis. And here are just a few case studies um, Karl Marx, of course, is famously known for um, highlighting abuses in production um, and labor issues. Um, but here we draw on the um, historian Sally Bras, who did a really interesting analysis of Marx's own clothing and the coat that he had to get in and out of the pawn shop in order to have access because of the class related dress code to get into the um, into the museum and library to where he needed to get um, his materials um, in uh, London. Um, and also here are the, the image of the sans culottes during the French Revolution points to the importance of the interplay between class and gender and national identity um, and how the revolution really shaped what is sometimes called the masculine re um, renunciation of fashion. Um, and then Denise, I think we was going to mention Aquafina here. Yeah, so on the, on the right is a screenshot from the 2018 film Crazy Rich Asians. And so we wanted to also think about, right, how fashion and how class is represented in Hollywood and films and television um, and how that, of course, intersects with, um, with race, uh, with nationality. Um, and in this case, the, this particular character in the film sort of represents the, the nouveau riche um, and the kind of costuming that was done for the character um, really kind of conveyed and, and reinforced, right? Stuart Hall is always thinking about, okay, what, what aspects of culture are being uh, perpetuated and what, what's being transformed? Um, and in a way, this sort of perpetuates this notion of, of the, the sort of gaudiness of um, nouveau riche and, and um, thinking about that through class. Uh, the next chapter, uh, we're thinking about gender. And uh, the image on the left is actually, that's me 
1985. That's just a few moments. Um, after I was born, they took me away and in the hospital and in this institution and they cleaned me up and they scotch taped a pink bow to my head, the, uh, the nurses, and then handed me back to my mother. And um, this image has always really, again, the story of the, the scotch taped bow um, on my head really kind of epitomizes the way gender, of course, is assigned at birth by doctors and, and uh, et cetera, and institutions, but it's also marked in uh, through fashion. Um, and so we're thinking about in this chapter, the way gender is marked, but also how it's produced and performed um, and how its ideas about gender are transformed um, as well. And so uh, the image on the right, of course, depicts the US Supreme Court justices um, back in 2005. Uh, and we write a little bit about um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the way that she used the judicial collar um, to, to both mark, but also to draw attention to the way, you know, it, it is marked, but all of the men in this image as well have neckwear, um, but because of, of the unmarked nature of that, we sort of don't notice it as much. So we write a little bit um, about that as well in the gender chapter. And then we move um, into uh, thinking about sexual subjectivities and style fashion dress, uh, thinking about how, you know, bodies and sexualities are produced and conveyed. Um, in the middle is a, a, a tank top um, that we use as a case study uh, that's by a brand called Dykes in the City. This was actually an Ithaca brand, um, now defunct. Uh, this was from their Do Ask, Do Tell collection in 2006. Uh, this was during the Iraq uh, war. And so it, it's both a critique um, of, you know, don't ask, don't tell, but it's not about wanting to join the military because it's also a critique of the Iraq war. Um, and so you see the, the image on the, the left there holding this bomb that's um, dripping with blood. And then, of course, the back saying no to bombs, um, yes to bombshells. Um, we also highlight, um, you know, the work of, of uh, queer activists, the gay liberation movement. Um, we write about Marsha P. Johnson and have this really incredible image of her at the second annual Stonewall anniversary march in 1971. Um, and of course, on the right is uh, Radcliffe Hall, um, uh, author of The Well of Loneliness uh, in, in this uh, sort of quintessential look uh, that she wore and she's with her, her partner, um, Una Trowbridge. The next um, chapter that we uh, add, this is a new chapter that was added um, to the text is a chapter on dressed embodiment. And in this chapter, we're thinking about the, the body, both at how it's been abstracted um, by the fashion industry. So things like size, you know, sizing um, and fit and the way that um, sizeism um, has been perpetuated by the by the industry itself, both um, through the materiality, what is available, how things are made, how they're sized, um, and the discourses as well that um, you know perpetuate fat phobia in particular. And so we we talk about the way that bodies have been stigmatized and regulated. Um, and then this uh, new movement um, really to destigmatize um, and celebrate uh, fat bodies um, and to rec again this uh, act, this this kind of reclamation, reclaiming, a word that has historically been um, used as a pejorative. And in the case, for example, of Lindy West, um, who is photographed here in her wedding gown, um, she writes about coming out as fat. 
um, and sort of taking from this, this term from the queer community of coming out um, and coming out as fat. And so she wears in this image, this is her wedding dress, um, which she worked with a, a friend to co-design um, and to break all the rules that she had grown up being told, rules about how to, you know, minimize the body or to wear, you know, uh, wear flowing garments so as not to draw attention. So she um, is wearing this really like form fitting uh, uh, dress that really celebrates um, the body. And so uh, writes about flaunting fat. And so uh, similarly with the image, we have a Lizzo in this um, Moschino dress uh, designed by Jeremy Scott as well, you know, playfully um, flaunting uh, bodies. And in this chapter, we, we move from thinking about bodies and sizeism to ableism as well, and how fashion and design really, in more generally, um, this is a, a site of, of um, ableism, right? So really thinking about how, um, fashion articulates with disability and how fashion can be a kind of opportunity to, to challenge um, and to create new, new um, uh, garments. So I think Susan's gonna talk about the um, image on the right. Um, yeah, so Keisha Greaves um, founded this company called, called Girls Chronically Rock. Um, and it, it's, it was a way for her to um, uh, herself to deal with her own chronic illness and to um, draw on her background in um, fashion and business in um, college to create her own business um, with the strong support of her mother and to um, really bring out um, in a way kind of uh, flaunt as the, the as the concept that we found to be um, kind of connective here. Um, this um, brought me back to some research I had done in the 1980s, um, which we drew on and tried to sort of update. Denise did a brilliant job of taking the lead on that um, chapter. Um, but it was really um, important, we thought, to, to draw out issues of the body that are overlooked or um, really resented in fashion um, and discounted and to really turn that around. And to also um, really think about the way that fashion is can be um, a disabling environment um, and how to, to challenge that. So our final chapter, um, returning back to where we began this presentation today is called Bodies in Motion Through Time and Space. Um, the image in the center actually is, is one from the previous chapter and we talk about um, athletics uh, as well as bodily exceptionalism um, in that chapter, but it's sort of moving us into this final chapter both in its, in its motion, um, but motion obviously suggests movement right through um, time and space. And in that image, um, this is Olympian Susie O'Neill in a fast skin. Uh, and fast skin um, was a swimsuit designed by Speedo, uh, that this super high tech um, fabric that would reduce um, pole and enable the body to move, literally move faster uh, through water. Uh, the images on the left are um, actually from uh, shawls that were collected in 1882. Um, they appear in fact in, in an earlier chapter on uh, nation. Um, they're from the Nuchanath nations uh, and they were collected uh, to by you know anthropologists in the late 19th century and now are across the globe in the Ethnological Museum of Berlin. Um, and, but that what they depict is this kind of motion, right? Of trade, of exchange. Uh, there are three shawls. The one at the top is made of all materials that were sourced um, from the west coast of, of Vancouver Island, from Nuchanos Hahusi, which is uh, the word 
for traditional territories. Um, and then the one in the middle incorporating different trade blankets that had been a, a cut up and then re uh, this a wrap twining technique. And then the one at the bottom is actually an entire blanket that had been unraveled and then re, um, re-woven, uh, or it's wrapped twining technically, um, into the, the shawl in the typical silhouette um, that was fashionable at the time. And then the last image here um, is of Victor and Rolf's spring summer 2015 collection. Victor and Rolf are a Dutch uh, fashion house. Um, and what they did with this particular collection uh, was sort of re reappropriate Dutch Belisco, in particular wax prints, which have a very complex um, history of appropriation um, and production and distribution um, to West Africa and other places. So we get into to that specific case study as well through the circuit of style fashion dress. And so we return um, here to the Mobius strip at the as we close out our presentation, again, to, to, to think through um, time and space and the way that we are embodying that through our fashion every day as fashion subjects, um, both uh, subjected to, um, but also producing through our own intersectional um, subjectivities. Um, we wanna say thank you to many, many people, all of you that are here today, um, but especially to our very generous colleagues and students. Um, so many of our uh, Colleagues and students have read various parts of this, helped us in different ways, opened our eyes to a lot of uh, the case studies that we dove into. Um, and so we're really grateful to them and to our editor, Georgia Kennedy, um, and the team at Bloomsbury. And we had a number of really wonderful reviews that helped us to develop the text um, in new and different ways. And then a thank you as well to um, Kimberly Jenkins, Ben Barry, Kelly Reddybest, um, and Patrizia Califato for uh, their reviews, which you can read in full on the Bloomsbury website, but they have um, uh, their little in, uh, shorter versions on the back of the book. Um, Sarah Catterall did an amazing job with the index. We're so grateful to her, um, of course, to our family and friends and the Cornell University Library and the team at MAN for organizing this event today. So thank you all for coming. Um, we would love to take any questions that you might have and a reminder, you're welcome to use this discount code um, today to purchase your copy of the book um, so that you can you know, read uh, with more depth about the study case studies we sort of um, went over uh, today and many more. So we'll we'll gladly take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, thank you. So my right back at you both, um, uh, Su Susan, uh, uh, Susan and uh, Denise. And uh, what a, you know, what a great talk! And not not only because you started it with that great shout out to the library stacks. Um, <laughs> I mean, I certainly love the whole talk and. I was glad to see that there were a number of books uh, uh, that appeared to be missing from that. Uh, yeah, that yeah. So yeah. It, my, it, it, my students are headed to the library and checking out books. So. Yeah, I have to say that that section of the stacks that is definitely one of those ones where you're more likely than not, you know, often more likely to find the book. Oh, it's in circulation. I'm going to have to recall it or get a borrow direct or some something like that. In any case, I am Evelyn Ferretti, um, and I am here to moderate um, the questions or to present the questions really to come in by a chat. I'll just reiterate that you are welcome to put in, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will be presenting them in the order received. And we have in fact received a few already. So I'll go ahead and start with the first one. Um, and that came from Michael. Um, Michael asks this, my question for Susan and Denise is, what level of student do you think the fabulous new release of the text is suited for? Um, I would say it was written really for a kind of first, second year. Um, it's, it's very much a kind of introduction to fashion and cultural studies very broadly. Um, and while it does dive into these very specific case studies, I think it's, a, it's an excellent introduction for a first or second year course. What do you think, Susan? 
So the the first edition was um, was used at every level from the first year to graduate level with, of course, supplemental um, readings. Um, so I think we tried to make it very accessible um, and maybe in part the way it's structured um, makes it a little bit easier for students to kind of connect the dots and to focus in on some concepts that they have some relationship to. So our, our goal is, you know, to make it accessible at multiple levels. Okay, um, next question is from Alejandra. Are we by all, def excuse me, are we all by definition fashion subjects? Uh, not, she's not too clear on how this concept is defined. If you could elaborate, please. Short answer is yes, <laughs> <laughs> whether we like it or not. <laughs> yeah, the, the sociologist Georg Zimmel talked about how um, you can't kind of get out uh, outside of the fashion system. I mean, even if you resist it, um, you're still responding in some ways um, to fashion. So I think because we think of it as a collective process of change, even you know people who say they're really not fashion subjects and and no, who goes around saying that anyway, <laughs> you know. Um, I think probably are not immune to changes because the marketplace itself makes it um, something that has to be reckoned with. Okay, so subjects meaning we re responding in one way or the other, we respond mm -hmm. to. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this next question is from Tamara. Hello, everyone. I am doing my BA thesis on Hanbok Batik, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly which is a new Asian hybrid fashion phenomenon combining Korean and Indonesian culture. Do you think there will be many more hybrid fashion phenomena in the future like the one I'm writing about? And if so, why? I would say yes. <laughs> Definitely one of the things that we write about um, in the book is hybrid styles and, and transculturation because inevitably um, fashion is about ongoing change and we're constantly uh, being influenced by the people we meet, the things that we see, um, and there is this back and forth. And this is this goes very far back, um, you know, since the the dawn of of cultures moving and seeing and reacting and communicating and learning from one another. Um, and of course, there are the complexities of that too, right? When we we also write about um, issues of cultural appropriation and thinking about power and how that is working in, in these moments of um, hybrid styles and, and transculturation. Thank you. Next question is from Elizabeth. You talked a lot about intersectionality, so I know you are already thinking in these terms, but can you talk more about how you are thinking about your own whiteness and queerness when, when thinking about gays and authorial, excuse me, authorial editorial voices? Thank you, Bishop. Um, yeah, so we actually, we open the book in our acknowledgements, um, really bringing this issue forward right away, um, because of course, positionality and our own um, subjectivities are going to shape the text. And so we, we open up with this um, as a sort of framing um, around the entire text uh, and we certainly also use that space in, in, the, in, in this introductory part of the acknowledgements to welcome um, challenge to, uh, to actually say that we're not the authority, in fact, and that we, we welcome um, critique and challenge because this is such an important part of what we do as academics is to, um, to constantly question, and this is, ultimately what we write about as well in thinking about cultural hegemony. And hopefully this text will inspire students and others, um, other academics and whomever reads it to really begin to question uh, critically and creatively what we take for granted as sort of quote unquote natural or normal and realize that that is in fact the, uh, a kind of production. I don't know, Susan, if you have. I just totally endorse <laughs> everything you said, ditto. 
All right. And Shiva has a question for us. What differences would you find in the terminological use between and among dress, fashion, fabric, attire, apparel, and many other terms? I would actually say Susan's uh, 1997 uh, social psychology of clothing book does a really good job. I don't know if you remember this, Susan, of sort of defining all of these different terms, apparel, um, attire, fabric. Uh, we don't necessarily do that in, in this text, but we do challenge some of the you know, assumptions that are made around particular words or some of the, the problems with, for example, the word costume um, is can be really quite othering. Um, and we so we do bring up some of those issues, but we don't actually go through and necessarily define all of those terms. And I think maybe Susan can speak to this, why we find um, Carol Tullock's concept of style fashion dress is so powerful is that it doesn't necessarily hold any one of these terms to a specific static definition, but really thinks about them as uh, relational and um, whole in part. Exactly. Um, I mean, this has really been um, a big theme in the field, just debating different terms. What are departments called? What are programs called? Um, what are the pros and cons of terms? Um, and, and so, as Denise said, Carol Tullock's style fashion dress concept reminds us to think about parts and wholes. Sometimes we focus more on one than another, but they're all kind of present. And uh, we kind of wanted to kind of move away from choosing one term, you know, as the one that should be used. And I think another um, thing that we're trying to do when we open up the book with in the first chapter is challenging the idea that fashion is a Euro-American phenomenon. So we right off the bat um, open up and expand our definition of fashion, again, is a way to decenter that narrative of sort of white, um, you know, Euro, European American as the is what fashion is, and then everything else, you know, is traditional dress. So we sort of break down all of these binaries um, at the beginning and sort of blow them apart, and then um, and then approach from there. Great. Um... This question from Catherine. Great presentation, thank you. Were there any fashion style issues that you, about which you as collaborators fundamentally disagreed? Hmm, good question. Um, that is a good question. We're, we enjoy thinking through things <laughs> together, I think. And so um, I think disagreement is actually a really productive thing. Um, and when it doesn't end up getting polarized where you, you can't, you're not open to changing your mind. And I think both Susan and I have, uh, I, I hope, you know, I like to think that we're, um, myself speaking for myself, that I want to be challenged and I want to be pushed to question my assumptions and to question, uh, things that I've again, taken for granted as just the way things are. Um, and so I think we have a good collaborative relationship in that sense that we, when we come to each other with a critique, we know it's from a place of um, hope to, to develop our scholarship and to make it more justice oriented because if we keep doing things the way we always did, right, we're gonna end up reproducing uh, these systems of oppression. Um, but specific yeah. um, I, don't know. I don't think not not anything major maybe you know a word choice here or there or um you know challenging each other to come up with different examples or something like that oh. or case studies yeah. I tried to make Susan smile for her picture that we took <laughs> for the poster <laughs> yeah that was an issue she, disagree about that. <laughs> she did smile it's just not with teeth yeah. <laughs> Oh, Evelyn, I, I, Evelyn, I think you're muted. Oh, muted, muted, sorry, yes. Oof. Okay, terrific presentation, this is from John. Terrific presentation, it was one, a wonderful survey of the diversity of style fashion subjects. I was, of the diversity of style, style fashion subjects, excuse me. I was wondering if you could discuss some contrast to, for example, the Jewish versus Islamic examples you gave. 
I'll let Susan do that. And I noticed uh, Janet Hethorn has a, a request for the code. So I'm going to look that up and type it in. <laughs> okay. um, could you read the question again, the last part? Y yes, it was. I was wondering if you could discuss some contrasts to, for example, the Jewish versus Islamic examples you gave. Okay. And how, and how, sorry, there's a second part of that question, and how that illuminates the creation process. Right. So I'd have to say in terms of what has been studied and what's available in the literature, there is a whole lot more on um, kind of the consumer side of um, Muslim fashion, although production and distribution are there as well. So I'd say in terms of what was available to analyze, um, there was just much more um, on Muslim fashion. And um, with respect to Jewish fashion, um, it comes back to that issue of um, that continuum of unmarked to marked. So it was actually the more um, orthodox um, forms of Jewish dress, um, such as Hasidic, that um, that tend to be studied, not the not the less marked, you might say, um, forms of um, Jewish style. So. In that way, there was just some difference in the way uh, people have paid attention um, to the subjects. All right, wonderful. So this question is from Susan. I think we have, how many more questions do we have? Just a couple more. And I think we might have time. Um, I think we might have time for the last two questions here. S question from Susan. As someone raised in the 50s, I lived for decades with the Barbie doll image of what bodies should look like. The current generation's acceptance of all body types in specific, in many fields, sorry, I didn't quite that, in many fields, including high fashion, is fascinating to me. Where do you see this trend heading and how is it migrating into different fields? For example, in the 1980s, there was a lot of research into how women needed to dress to get a job. Have corporations also begun to ignore appearance in their hiring? So the very last, could you restate the last part of the... I, sorry, I apologize. Yes, uh, the last the last question. Last, there's a, a question stuck in. So the question is, um, where do you think this trend, the acceptance of all body types, is is is, is um, how is it migrating into different fields? And then the last part of it is, having corporations themselves also begun to ignore appearance in hiring. Yeah. So I I do think the trend is is going in a good direction. To as Denise talked about, um, to to be more inclusive of multiple. Um, body types, shapes, sizes, abilities, um, and corporations, um, at least some are, are really trying to um, highlight diversity, equity, and inclusion in ways probably that is, is getting into that. The fashion industry, you know, I mean, it's, it's making some um, attempts to, to um, move in that direction. It's, you know, there's probably a whole um, or there's really a long way to go on that. Um, with respect to the Barbie <laughs> situation uh, and the body types um, from that, um, my four-year-old granddaughter really wanted a Barbie dream house for Christmas. So we, we, I found myself getting her one, being nostalgic for my own um, times with it. But, but yeah, the body size issue, the you know, those issues um, are very real and, and still continuing. Um, in the way um, there's a distortion involved I, in that. Yeah, and I think that the more, um, one of the things that Lindy West writes about in her book, Shrill, is um, the importance of just seeing more different kinds of, you know, oh, the whole range. And the media has been so dominated by the same kinds of bodies of the same, you know, white, thin, young, wealthy women um, as representing what fashion is and, and seeing that image over and over and over again. And so when we start to see that, that discourse shift, um, there's a proliferation of so many more possibilities. And this, is, this creates a kind of opportunity for greater inclusion and, and being able to see uh, and connect, right? And to be part of, to feel a connection to something and not to feel completely and totally excluded. Yes, yes, very good. Um, so I, this is gonna be our last question from Nina. 
Hello, Susan and Denise. Following up on the question regarding collaborative disagreements and thinking through together, how and thinking through together, how did your collaboration reshape the nature and content of this new edition? Well, there's. I think it's also about time and space. <laughs> I, I want to point out that we did so much of this work um, during the pandemic. And I think we had aspired to do a lot more of it before the pandemic, but this, this, the way that the world shifted in that moment, it really enabled us, I think, Susan, to dive deeper into just like we, we talked on the phone a lot. Um, and in terms of how that reshaped, you know, this was a really I mean, both the pandemic, um, but also the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police officers, um, just it, then the way the pandemic was having impacts on the fashion industry and garment workers. And so there's just so much going on. And at the same time, there was also nothing going on because you couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Um, and so that, that context enabled us to really um, get into some of these issues. And so I think that's a big part of um, the reshaping was thinking about what was happening in the contemporary moment that we were writing. Um, and the challenge of course, with writing about fashion is fashion is always changing. So um, we'll have an, another edition, I'm sure in the future. I don't know, Susan, if you have any. I totally agree. Um, the collaboration dramatically transformed um, the original um, book. And I'm very grateful for Denise's involvement. Um, and as she said, you know, almost daily interactions, certainly at least by text. And, and so much of it was sort of unfolding as we were writing and reflecting. And um, we, did, we did spend a lot of time um, zeroing in or going, um, drilling down on a lot of issues that um, were happening at the time. Well, thank you all so much for attending thank you. this afternoon. Thanks for the great questions. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for moderating the Q&A. And, and thank you both, Denise and Susan, for a wonderful presentation uh, and for allowing us to share in the celebration of your new books released today. I'm also very grateful to our audience for joining us, and I hope that everyone enjoyed this event as much as I did. I should note that this book talk has been recorded, and in a couple of weeks' time, it will be available as part of our Chats in the Stacks playlist on Man Library's YouTube channel, uh, the URL for which my colleague has either put in the chat or will be putting in the chat really soon. <laughs> uh, so if any of you know someone who would have liked to have been here but couldn't, please feel free to share that information with them. Uh, finally, Cornell University Library's Spring Book Talk series will start up again this coming February. So for a preview of how that roster is shaping up and with an eye towards saving some dates, please check out the Book Talk page, also now being typed into the chat panel. Uh, I thank you all again for coming uh, and wish you all a wonderful evening and a very safe winter holiday season ahead. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.